Good morning and welcome again. It's so good to connect with everyone through this platform yet again. I've been so encouraged by all the stories of how God has been working in your life, how he's been working in my life. I've seen on social media people talking about it, how the Lord is using this time right now to draw us nearer to him, to give us a greater love and passion for him. And I just pray that continues, that God would continue to use this time, something the enemy wants to use for evil, that God would use it for good, for our good, and for his glory. And I pray that it continues. And one day I pray that we'll be able to look back as we congregate together again, and we'll be able to rejoice in what the Lord did in our hearts in this time. And so I want to encourage everyone, just like last week, to take this moment. Let's just gather our families around right now. Let's quiet the home. Let's quiet our souls before the Lord right now and prepare our hearts to worship him, to open his word together as a family. And I just want to uh, encourage you dads out there, if there's a dad in the family watching right now, the men in the household, if, if you're there, would you please uh, be the leader right now? This is a great opportunity for you to step up and lead your family well. So let's, let's do that, dads. Let's do that, husbands. Let's lead our families in this time. I'm going to pray for us. So I want to encourage you as I pray that you as a family together, you pray as well and prepare to worship the Lord right where you're at in your home. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have yet again to worship you. God, I thank you uh, that we can gather through something like technology like this uh, to worship Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And God, I pray that this morning you would be highly exalted across the nation and across the world, that you would use this time in our lives as Americans, God, to slow us down, to help us be about the things that, are, that we ought to be about, Lord, the things that are most important. Help us to, to fall more in love with you in this time, God. And I pray that as we uh, are gathered right now to, to hear from you in your word and to sing praises to your name. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to focus, and I pray that you would be worshiped in spirit and in truth this morning. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Would you join with me as we worship our God? I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody, I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing. In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me I raise a hallelujah I will watch the darkness flee I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah Fear you lost your hold on me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise 
death is defeated, the King is alive. Sing after me. Sing a little louder. 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 In the presence of my enemies, sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief, sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody, sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me, sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies, sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief, sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody, sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me, sing a little louder. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive Who I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. Raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I want to read uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17 with you. It says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit? dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Be 
Thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that Thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. Be thou my wisdom and thou. I heed not, or man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only be first in my King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, High King of heaven, my victory. Heaven, Son, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, 
the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, with every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. And yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the salvation that we have in Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we do not have to fear death, that because you died on the cross and that you rose again to new life, God, we can have life as well, Lord, if we put our faith and trust in you as our Savior. God, I pray that you would use the message that Dave has prepared for us this morning. Lord, use it in my life. Speak into my heart this morning. Refresh my mind, Lord. Refresh me, Lord. God, that I could be made anew for this week to do things for your kingdom. Lord, I pray, God, for anyone who may be lost watching this feed right now, Lord. God, I pray that your spirit would draw them to repentance, draw them to salvation. For there's no other name 
that anyone can be saved but by the name of Jesus. And Lord, it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning, O Bethel Baptist Church, and to our friends and family joining in with us this morning. If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. This morning, I want us to look at verses 12 through 17 together, as I believe we're given a picture of what the church of Jesus Christ should look like. So turn over to Colossians chapter 3 and hold your finger there for just a second, as I want to begin today with a question. If you could have church any way you wanted it, how would it look? Think about that question. If we could have church any way that we desired, what would our church look like? Would it carry the name Baptist in it? Or would denomination even matter? Would that church be heavily involved in missions, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ inside the community, inside the state, inside of our country, and even internationally? Would missions carry an emphasis in the church of your preference? Would that church carry a strong emphasis in children's ministry and even student ministry, meaning that it leans heavily into young families? So the things that they do inside that church would tend to lead towards the young families. Or would it tend to emphasize more the senior adult ministry, therefore leaning into their needs and their wants? Would that church sing hymns with a piano? Or would it be the more contemporary style, again, leaning towards the older or the younger? Would your preacher be a younger preacher with many of today's newer ideas and new thoughts? Or would he be an older preacher standing on the way things have always been? What version of the Bible would the church of your preference preach from? Church, I'm asking that question. What would be the important traits inside the church of your desire if it was geared around your preferences? And I ask this this morning because that's what the Apostle Paul is about to speak into our lives. He's writing here to the church of Colossae, sharing with them the characteristics and the details of what the perfect church of Jesus Christ should look like. But I want us to take note, because we're about to realize very fast that Paul does not list off any of the characteristics or the preferences that we just mentioned a moment ago. Why? Because I want to remind us, the church is not a building, and the church is not about the different functions that take place inside of the church building. The church is us. We are the church of Jesus Christ. Everything that I listed just a moment ago are simply our preferences. There are our desires and our likes, the things that we want inside of the church. But I remind us, we are the church. We're the body of Jesus Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul is about to speak into. The heart of the body of Christ. The heart of the church. Because if our hearts are right, our preferences will fall in line. Because our pursuit will be Jesus and not our own desires. So let's listen this morning, and let's read it together, if you will. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. I pick up in verse 12. Therefore, he says, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called into one body, and be thankful. Let the word of God dwell richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Church, what a description. What a true picture this morning of the bride of Christ, the body of Jesus Christ, as God himself designs for us to be, the true church. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, I pray as we step into this time of word together, God, I pray that you would speak through me. God, that you would fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit, that I would speak only that which you give to me. 
God, as we challenge ourselves, as we stir ourselves, God, as we look in the mirror to remember who we are truly called to be, putting our preferences and our desires aside, and God, truly gleaning off who you want us to be this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Church, I want to begin, if you don't mind, by looking at that beginning word that Paul speaks there in verse 12. Before we even get to number one, I want us to look at that word, therefore. Church, that word, therefore, comes in the form of an imperative, meaning that this is not a suggestion for Paul. This is not just an idea he says you might want to take consideration of. This is a command. Paul is giving a command to the church. He says that as the children of God, we are to be merciful, kind, humble, meek, long-suffering, and bearing with one another. Can you imagine a church that functioned truly like this? That church would be a pure reflection of Jesus Christ. I believe that church could literally turn the world upside down. That's my heart for us. That's my desire for a Bethel Baptist church, for the church of Jesus Christ. So I want us to stop this morning, take our next couple of moments together, and consider what a church like this really would look like today in 2020. So number one, I believe it would be a church that works together. Not a church that's disunified, that works in its own direction, but a, work, a church that works together. Look at what Paul says beginning in verse 12. As the elect of God, the call of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And then he says this, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called into one body. He says, as God's elect, as God's chosen people, he's commanding us to put on these characteristics, these traits, if you will, and to work together as one in the name of Jesus Christ. So let me take that apart, if you don't mind. Let me go one character trait at a time and share with us how that would apply to us. Beginning there in verse 12, he says the first one is tender mercies. To put on tender mercies. Now, men, I know that doesn't sound very manly, but let me share with you what that truly means. Tender mercies means that we're to have an attitude of the heart, a condition of the heart that's tender, an attitude or a condition of the heart that's compassionate, one that senses the needs of others that are around us. The picture that draws into my mind is this. Imagine if I were to take my family to the mall. We, we set off that morning. We went to Dothan, Alabama. We just spent a day together, my wife and my two children, and we walked around together, laughed, and just enjoyed each other's presence. And then lunchtime came around, so we walked into the food court. We went to Chick-fil-A because we're supporting Christian industries. And I buy them the meal that they want, the, the drinks that they want, the French fries and those chicken sandwiches and ch chicken nuggets. And we go to our table and we begin to enjoy that time of fellowship together. We're laughing and giggling. But then I look up and I notice across the way an elderly, elderly man that's sitting there by himself. And I can't help but notice that he's looking back and forth at us. He doesn't have much food in front of him. We have a, a whole display in front of us, but he hasn't much. We're enjoying our presence together and we're laughing together. And he's alone. And I could tell that. I could sense that. Church tender mercies is when I have the compassion and the love that I look past my moment and I walk over to that man and I invite him to come and sit with us. Why? Because my heart is broken for what he does not have compared to what we do have. Church, can you imagine a body of Christ that has this characteristic? Tender mercies that's broken for the needs of other people, not our own needs, but the needs of others. Imagine what God could do with a church like that. How about the second one that we're gonna look at? And that's the characteristic of kindness. What does he mean by kindness? Imagine an individual that comes to the church early one morning, and he goes in the sanctuary early, and he finds the spot that he wants. Inside of El Bethel, we have pews. So he walks into the sanctuary early before we've ever began, before anybody else comes in. And he walks and he finds the pew that he wants, and he sits down at the very edge of the pew, right by the aisle, because he wants to be there so when time's over, he can get out real fast. 
And because he's gotten there early and he's found his spot, as the church begins to pile in, nobody can get past him. So the whole aisle beside him, the whole pew beside him is empty. There are people on the other end that have come in, but not next to him because he's there on the very end. Church service begins. The music has begun. People have begun singing when a family walks in together. They're late. And they notice that there's this space beside him and they could fit in. So they walk up next to him and say, sir, may we sit? What does that gentleman do? What would you do? Most would stand up and step into the aisle and say, sure, you can scoot in, rather than simply scooting down themselves. You know what true kindness is? Not getting something from it yourself, but being willing to scoot down and let that family come in, not causing a bigger spectacle, if you will, but scooting down in the love of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine a church that functioned like that? Kindness and love overflowing past themselves, which actually steps into the, the next character trait, which is humility. Humility being the fact that we think of others before ourselves. Brings it to my mind immediately this past Sunday with our first online service. After it was all done, um, several of us inside the church began to text each other, excited about how the morning went, that we really were able to worship together, even though we're separated. We're now in our own homes, and we were still able to worship together, and we were excited about that. So many of us, myself included, began texting back and forth saying, you know what I liked about it most? I sat in my recliner, because I did. I had my chair leg up, and I sat back, and I sat in the comfort of my home. Somebody else texted back and said, you know what? I had the temperature where I wanted it. I put the temperature right where I desired it. Somebody else texted in, and we're laughing now. It's joking. Hey, you know what I did? I turned the lights level to where I wanted it. If I wanted it bright, I turned it up. And somebody else said, well, guess what? I had the volume level right where I desired it. And we kind of giggled and laughed back and forth of what we wanted for that morning and how it made it different. But you know what's sad? Joking aside, we usually walk into church every Sunday with our own preferences. The temperature that we want, the sound level that we want, the comfort of sitting down the way we desire it. Imagine a church that was humble, that really came in looking to others' desires first. Imagine a, a young family that maybe, maybe they like the more contemporary style music, but they cannot help but notice that morning as we're singing a hymn, they look across and they see that, that elderly lady that's standing up and this is one of her favorite songs that she grew up with and she's worshiping. And they can't help but take note of that and say, God, I pray in Jesus' name that we can move past ourselves and just let us worship to that style because I see how it ministers into her life. Or maybe it's that elderly individual that's looking across at the younger, younger family who's now playing that more contemporary style and they see that, that family worshiping together and that elderly person says, God, forgive me. Let us just worship and let that family worship in spirit and truth. Imagine a church that would put aside its preferences for the needs of others that true worship takes place. Humility, dying to our own desires. The next character trait was meekness and long-suffering. That word long-suffering, I'll be honest with you, that's one of my favorites. I've loved that word since I was a little boy. I can still remember sitting in Sunday school when our teacher would ask us, what's the favorite word inside of the scriptures? Your favorite word inside the word of God that describes God to you the most. Mine, I would always raise my hand and say long-suffering. Why? Long-suffering. God suffers long with me. He endures much of my, my immaturity, my weaknesses, my struggles, my stubbornness, my failures, the fact that God endures much with me. Can you imagine a church that was long-suffering with each other? We were patient with each other. We forgave each other no matter what the wrong was. We didn't retaliate. Instead, we endured much along each other's side. Can you imagine a church that acted and responded in such a function, in such a character as this? Sadly, I know a lot of churches today that act just the opposite. And sadly, I know a lot of people who have been hurt by such churches. Let that not be said of us at Old Bethel Baptist Church. Let us have a heart for Jesus Christ. I want to encourage us, as Paul's even speaking here to the church of Colossae, as he encouraged them, I encourage us to take up the love of Jesus Christ inside of us. How many of you remember the Persian War of 1990? better known as the Persian Gulf War 
between 1990 and 1991 between Iraq and Kuwait. Iraq had invaded Kuwait, taken over their oil fields. The United Nations responded with uh, the United States kind of leading the way in order to free Kuwait. Did you know that we lost 219 soldiers in that war? 219 of our finest gave their lives to help earn Kuwait's freedom. I took better note of this. Of the 219 deaths, did you know that 35 of our soldiers died by friendly fire? Do you know what friendly fire is? It's when one of our own soldiers, by accident, shoots too close and kills one of their own teammates. When one of our own soldiers, by accident, when they drop a bomb, it lands too close and it takes out some of our own. They call that friendly fire. Church, too often, that's what we're seeing inside the church today. Here in 2020, I believe the church's biggest enemy is not those that are on the outside. Too often, it's those who are on the inside. As the body of Christ, we've begun to wound each other with friendly fire. What's the number one reason? The number one reason a non-Christian refuses Christianity. Christians not acting like Christ. Friendly fire. Verse 14 of Colossians 3 today says, Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called into one body. Our actions are to be that of love and peace, unifying as one in the name of Jesus Christ. John chapter 13, verse 35. By this, all will know that you're my disciples, Jesus says, if you have love for one another. We're called to unity. We're called to work together to love and to serve this lost world reaching them in the name of Jesus Christ. Church, let me encourage us today to put on the bond of love, to walk in the unity of Christ, carrying out these characteristics to let Jesus be seen inside of us. We're working as the body of Christ. Number two, it's a church that worships together. A church that worships together. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Church, he's telling us how we're to worship. Did you notice how he began that verse, by the way? True worship, he says, begins inside the word of God. Listen again to verse 16. He says, let the word of Christ Dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I believe this is what he's saying. It's when and as we allow the word of God to permeate our lives, to fill our lives, that we'll then begin to admonish one another in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs singing together. And if that's true, then that leads back to the question I asked us last week. How was your quiet time this morning? Your time inside the word of God. Because according to what he's saying here now, we cannot worship together if we're not spending time in the word of God together. We cannot worship together. We'll never experience true worship as the people of God if we don't come together already full of the word of God. Listen to me if you don't mind. Think about this, church. Listen to what Tony Evans says. If we limit our worship to where we are. If we limit our worship to being inside the building, the the church building of El Bethel, the moment we leave that place of worship, the church building, we'll also leave behind our attitude of worship just like the bulletin you left on the pew. Consider that for a second. He goes on to say this, worship is letting the word of God invade and transform our hearts so that we're able to walk wisely inside this life. We're allowing the word of God to transform our hearts so we can step into that time of worship together. Continuing, he says, worship is letting the word of God dwell richly in you, letting it fully and completely take over your life, letting it both teach you and admonish you. Do you know what that word admonish means? To correct, to bring conviction. Did you know this morning, even as God brings conviction in our life, that can be an act of worship. It's simply allowing the word of God to move and to work inside of our lives. Church, yes, 
Singing psalms and singing hymns and spiritual songs is an act of worship. But it's also allowing the word of God to move inside of us, transforming us and changing us to who God desires for us to be. If we really, at Obethel, want to be the church of Jesus Christ, it begins inside the word of God. Therefore, I I encourage us the necessity of spending time individually and personally in your quiet time. Letting God move in our hearts, move in our lives, drawing us closer to him so when we come together as the body of Christ, our overflow will lead to true worship. Worship in spirit and worship in truth. Amen? Now let's look at number three and our final point for this morning. A church that God designs is a church that witnesses together. Number one is a church that works together. Number two is a church that worships together. And number three is a church that witnesses together. Look at what Paul says in verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever the church is doing, church, whatever a Christian does, Paul says we are to do for the name of the Lord Jesus. We are literally to be the hands and the feet of Christ. The church is to be a witness to this lost and dying world, no matter what we say and no matter what we do. I remind you, somebody's always watching. Somebody's always listening to us. They want to know if we're real, if we're allowing Christ to come out of our lives. I want to remind you this point, church. The church is not here just to come together on Sundays and Wednesday nights. That's not why we exist. We're not called simply to meet together and impact ourselves We're called to impact the world that's around us. This is an example I heard a long time ago, and I've waited to use it forever. So let me share this this morning. Football. We all love football, whether it be college football or NFL. And I realize most of us love college football a whole lot more. You know that I'm a a diehard Florida State fan. Let me use that if you don't mind. When I pack my family up together, And we travel several hours down to Tallahassee, Florida to watch a football game. And I pay the money for that ticket price, not only for me, but for the rest of my family. We do not come together simply to watch the offense and the defense run out on the field and get together in that group of 11 and huddle up. Now, I love that they huddle. I love that they take the time to to get everything together to make sure that they're on the same page and they're carrying out in execution what they've been given. But you know what my greatest excitement is? is when they break the huddle and they go out and they perform. And I know some of you guys are laughing going, you're a Florida State fan, we haven't seen that in a long time. I get you, puns aside. Our favorite thing between our teams is not just to watch them come together as a huddle, but to watch them break the huddle and to go out to carry out that execution, score that touchdown, stop on defense, that offense from moving forward. Church, the same thing applies to us. It's good that we come together The word of God says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. To come to be equipped, to be encouraged, to be stirred. But church, all the more, it's when the church service is over and the back doors open up and we walk out into the lost world that's around us. That's when the true impact is is made. Not just that we huddle up, but that we go out unified in the name of Jesus Christ. So I want to ask us, El Bethel Baptist Church, what difference are we making inside of our community? What difference are we making in Enterprise, in Samson, in Geneva, in Bellwood, these surrounding communities around us? Let me take it a step further. If the rapture happened today, if Jesus Christ stepped out, that archangel blew the trumpet, and he took us home, what difference would it make in this community if suddenly we were not here? Would they realize it? This surrounding community, the friends and the family members that we have, would they even recognize that the church is gone? I pray they do. I pray that we're serving. I pray that these characteristics that we've mentioned are, are flowing out of our lives. Love and grace and peace and mercy and long-suffering and forgiveness. We're unified as one in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that they see our worship. I pray they hear us as they're driving by even, and that our worship is true. And I pray that they recognize our witness as we shine the light of Jesus Christ. El Bethel, who are we? Are we shining the light of Jesus? Are we showing the love of Jesus? Are we dying to ourselves to let Jesus Christ be seen in us? If we're the only Jesus Christ some people ever see, will they see Jesus Christ 
inside of us? Have you seen Jesus Christ inside of us? Who are we as the body of Christ? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this time inside your word this morning. God, I thank you for a time that we could study and listen as Paul speaks even to this church in Colossae, challenging them, stirring them to carry out these characteristics, to, to be the church of Jesus Christ, to be a witness in how we conduct ourselves and how we live every day, how we worship together and how we treat each other. God, I pray that we shine the light of Jesus. I pray that we show Jesus Christ in a, in a body together as we come together as one and even individually as we walk out in the name of Jesus. God, take us and use us for your glory. Amen. This morning, as you are listening to this time of study, I wonder if God wasn't speaking into your heart. Maybe God was speaking into your life this morning and you realized, you know what? I don't carry some of these characteristic traits. I, I don't have the, that love that you're speaking of and that unity inside the body of Christ. I don't even have a church that I attend. And maybe you're even starting to really kind of evaluate and look inside your own life and you're wondering about your own relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to invite you today. If you're unsure of, you can't look back at a time in your life and remember when you made Jesus Christ master and Lord, won't you make that decision today? Don't you want to be sure? We don't want to rest our, our, our faith in Christ, our relationship in Christ on hopes and thoughts when we know that we can walk in certainty. The Word of God says we can know of our salvation. This morning, if you're not sure, would you make that, make that decision today to be sure? Call out, as he tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, call out. Ask Jesus Christ to save you. Ask him to forgive you of your sins, knowing that the Word of God says, if we will, he'll answer. He'll answer us, he'll forgive you your sins, and he'll make you his own. Maybe this morning you need to do that. You need to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Or maybe this morning you've already made that decision. You've made Jesus Christ Master and Lord, but you're realizing as we're even studying this, that maybe sometimes we don't always show those truths, those characteristics. Too many times, our flesh is what's leading forward. Maybe this morning we could spend some time just praying individually, asking God, God, help me to die to myself. Help me to die to my flesh, that it's just you that's seen inside of me. Won't you take some time this morning individually to pray and let God do that work inside your heart? I also want to close up by asking this. Can we spend some time together praying as a church body for each other? Pray for me as your pastor, that my heart be right, my heart be true, that I sense and I feel the Spirit of God leading us and we're obedient to that leading of God. That even we as the leadership are the men and the women of God we're called to be. Can we pray for each other, encouraging each other, lifting each other up? I'm praying for you. I spent time even this morning praying over our church leadership, our deacons, our staff, calling their, their, their spouses even by name, praying for each other. That's our privilege and that's our responsibility. Will you spend some time praying this morning? Praying over this, this pandemic inside of our world today, inside of our country. Praying against it. Today is supposed to be a time that we are being called together as Southern Baptists and as Christians around the world, speaking against this virus, praying for God's healing. Will you join us as we pray in the name of Jesus? We can pray believing because our God is more than able. Let's pray together as we close out this morning. Father God, I lift up my brothers and sisters. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus, you would speak truth into their lives. God, you would surround them with your peace and your comfort. God, you would bless their homes. I pray, God, over this church body that we would shine the light of Jesus. God, that we would be, be bold in our witness, unashamed, unafraid to say you are our master and you are our Lord. And Father God, we close out this morning praying for our nation, praying against this world virus. God, I pray against the coronavirus in the name of Jesus. So many loved ones, so many friends and family members that we even know are coming down with symptoms that are, are similar to and might be. God, we speak against it by the blood of Jesus. I pray for your healing in their bodies. God, I pray for your touch of grace and mercy. God, do what only you can do. We stand together unified, believing this in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Oh, Bethel Baptist Church, friends and family, we love you and we are praying for you. And we look forward to meeting together again this coming Wednesday. Have a good morning.